Rolando Sarraf Trujillo, a man convicted by Cuban military tribunal and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Yet everyone outside of Cuba, from human rights groups to his sisters, for years have declared him to be innocent. Even Rody declared from prison that he was unjustly jailed. And here, the Obama administration tarnishes this man's reputation, declaring to the world that Rody is as guilty as hell. Cuba today released one of the most important intelligence agents that the United States has ever had in Cuba. The Obama administration alleged that Rowley was a cryptographer and that he provided the codes that enabled the agencies to capture the Cuban Five, Ana Montes, and the Myers, and probably every spy the U.S. catches from now on. Yet, whereas the remaining members of the Cuban Five were greeted as heroes in Cuba, and Alan Gross was greeted as a hero in the United States, poor Rowley was whisked away far from the cameras and hidden where no one can find him. Was Rowley guilty or not? Did he give crypto codes to the CIA or not? But this video is not exactly about whether Rowley is guilty or not, but about whether he had anything to do with outing Ana Montes. Was she caught because Rowley provided codes to the United States government that allowed the agencies to monitor her communications? Or was she caught because someone snitched on her? What is the official story? Well, when you dig into the public record, you find two stories two conflicting stories, and they both originate in the same sources. In April of 2013, over a year and a half ago, investigative reporter Jim Popkin writes an article in the Washington Post on how Ana Montes was detected and captured. He narrates a cloak-and-dagger saga of two computer bloodhounds who, through tenacious detective work, seek and find a needle at the Defense Intelligence Agency Haystack. According to Popkin, in September of the year 2000, an unidentified female intelligence officer contacts former Defense Intelligence Agency officer Chris Simmons, a slick spy master who has carved a niche in the Cuban exile community as an intelligence specialist. The mysterious woman told Simmons that the FBI had spent two years fruitlessly trying to identify a U.S. government employee who appeared to be spying for the Cubans. Armed with this vital information, Simmons now contacts his buddy Scott Carmichael, whom Popkin touts as an experienced DIA mole hunter. Although Carmichael thinks of himself as nothing more than a Kmart security guard, Carmichael methodically searches all the names and records in the DIA database in search of the employee who has bought a Toshiba laptop, the only clue the spy catchers have. Information which purportedly comes out of the WASP spy network investigation. So the system spits out the name of Ana Belen Montes. Bingo! He discovers that Ana Montes took out a loan to buy a Toshiba computer. The gossip now becomes fact. They have found their spy. Armed with this mathematically sifted information, Carmichael approaches FBI Special Agent John McCoy. But McCoy refuses to act, alleging that anyone can fit the description. Undeterred, headstrong, Carmichael goes over McCoy's head to the big boss. After several weeks of persuasion, the FBI reluctantly agrees to monitor Ana Montes. The counterespionage team discovers that Ana makes a public phone call. Now that is odd, because Ana has a portable phone. Why doesn't she use it? Bingo, the FBI has its spy. The suspicions materialize into facts. The operatives 
request a court order to break into Monte's apartment, where they find the Toshiba computer they were looking for. Inside it, the black bag burglars discover the cryptographic codes. They also find a shortwave radio and other items. They now have a solid case to bring to court. What a story. Made for the big screen. In fact, Popkin's story has been optioned by a film company to be made into a film. The problem is that Popkin's story contradicts the story that he's told about a month ago when they released Roly and exchanged him for the remaining members of the Cuban Five. Popkin begins his recent story by candidly confessing that despite working on the case for 10 years and talking to intelligence agents and inspecting countless documents, he never heard that there was a crypto geek who enabled the U.S. agencies to nab Montes. In fact, neither did the lawyer who defended one of the Cuban Five, who stated to Newsweek that, If I had known they had a person like that, we would have pressed for an exchange a long time ago. And even Felix Rodriguez, the CIA agent that was involved in the capture of Che Guevara, was just as surprised as everyone else in the intelligence community. Rolando Sarraf Trujillo. Mira, nunca hemos oído hablar de esa persona y es muy triste que después de 20 años ahora vengan a ocuparse de él cuando le interés por otra cosa. Y tampoco tenemos conocimiento realmente si eso es real como lo presentado el presidente. Estoy tratando de hacer contacto con amigos míos eh, de la agencia para saber si realmente es como ellos lo están planteando. No one in the intelligence community had ever heard about or talked about poor Rowley. Yet suddenly, every anonymous intelligence agent in Washington was testifying to Popkin, off the record of course, that Rowley was a cryptographer. In his new article, Popkin tells a different story from what he told a year and a half ago. He now introduces Rowley as the mysterious spy who provided the secret codes that enabled the CIA to monitor the communications between Cuba and its agents, and which led to the capture of Ana Montes. Let's briefly compare Popkin's two articles. An anonymous female FBI agent tells ex-DIA agent Chris Simmons that there is a high-level employee in the U.S. government spying for Cuba. Presumably, this information surfaces from the investigation of the WASP spy network. Simmons tells Carmichael. Carmichael runs a check on the DIA employee database. The system spits out Ana Montes' name. Carmichael tells FBI Special Agent McCoy, and the FBI puts a tail on Montes. The counterintelligence team sees her calling from a public payphone. FBI gets a court order to do a black bag on her apartment. The FBI finds the Toshiba computer and a shortwave radio. Later, they find the crypto codes in her purse. The article on Rowley goes exactly in the opposite direction. Popkin begins with the cryptographic codes and ends up locating Montes. Rowley works at the M15, wiretapping and surveillance, which doesn't deal with cryptography or crypto codes at all. Rowley works as a journalist, but somehow secretly moonlights as an expert cryptographer. Rowley passes cryptographic codes to the CIA through an undisclosed mediator. Popkin now quotes anonymous intelligence sources. He gave up how the Cubans transmitted high-frequency broadcasts. He revealed communication shortfalls that the CIA could take advantage of. The technical data and mastery of Cuban cryptography keys that Saraf Trujillo imparted to the CIA would guide and even supercharge American investigators' efforts for more than a decade, inextricably linking him with his polar opposite in espionage, even as he helped to out her. So, which is it? Was Ana Montes detected when the CIA listened to cryptographic codes over the airwaves? Or was Ana Montes discovered by the FBI through slick sleuthing by Simmons and Carmichael at the DIA database? But Popkin goes out of his way to fit the codes at all costs into his new article in order to justify Rowley. 
From the records, American investigators knew where to look and how to decipher encrypted messages sent to illegal agents hiding in the U.S. The problem with this version is that it is out in the open in the Cuban exile community that the WASP network was not detected through encrypted messages. The members of the WASP spy network were caught like almost all spies are caught. They were caught when someone snitched on them. They were ratted out by one of their own. Usted conoció a los miembros de la Red Avispa. Y yo conocí a los que eran oficiales e ilegales de la, de la red. O sea, a Gerardo, a Fernando y a Ramón Labañero. ¿De qué año estamos hablando? 1994. ¿Desde el 1994 ya ustedes estaban en eso? Sí, yo, yo llegué en junio de 1993. Entonces las autoridades norteamericanas sabían eso. ¿Usted cree no, que la estaban rastreando? Ya, ya yo le dije que cuando yo llegué a este país, se yo puse en conocimiento las autoridades norteamericanas las intenciones que tenía la inteligencia en relación con Ariel. Entonces, ya de ahí en adelante, por inferencia lógica, podemos deducir que Gerardo Hernández estaba ubicado desde ese, desde ese entonces de las reuniones suyas en el Kmart, en el año 94. Let's now ponder a more realistic scenario. It is a fact that Popkin's article comes out just when the Cubans and the Americans are negotiating in secret. Popkin's article is quite popular among people who follow intelligence matters. All that Mr. Obama had to do was find the right hero that would play the title role. The team that President Obama sent to negotiate with the Cubans a year and a half ago was well aware that there would be an outcry from the Cuban exile community and from conservative politicians if they traded the remaining Cuban five spies for Alan Gross, who was touted as a hostage. They had to trade the three Cubans for someone else. But who? How could they decide on a worthwhile candidate, someone who they could safely sell to the public? That's when they came up with Rowley. Rowley met several requirements and conditions that served the interests of the negotiators. Up front, Raul Castro had no operational interest other than vengeance to hold Rowley back. Rowley had no information to give the Americans. If he did, Castro would not have released him. It's just that simple. In fact, it is very suspicious that Raul Castro moved Roli to the Marianao prison about a year and a half ago, shortly after negotiations between the U.S. and Cuba started. Roli was kept in solitary confinement for 16 years at the maximum security Guanahai prison. Then suddenly, in November of 2013, Roli was transferred to the Villa Marista prison, where he mingled with the general population. Roli had served 20 years, almost all of his sentence. This already made him sellable to the American public. He was a guy who had endured most of his youth in a communist prison. If that didn't stir compassions and pity, the reasoning would be straightforward in the eyes of the public and easy to swallow. This guy must have done something pretty nasty to Fidel Castro if he was sentenced to 25 years. And what else could that be if not spying for the United States? His 20-year lockup gave a guy like Rowley, who had been an intelligence officer, a great advantage over other candidates. The main one being that nobody in the U.S. knew anything about him and could not verify any of the claims made by the Obama administration. Mr. Obama was free to say, and did say, anything he wanted about Rowley. It is thus that Rowley was presented as an expert cryptographer, despite that he worked at the M15, the Surveillance and Wiretapping Department. Rowley studied and worked as a journalist. The Cubans do not recruit people with such a background to do cryptographic work. Neither do the Americans. But just as convenient was the fact that the M15, together with the entire Cuban intelligence system 
had been overhauled in the mid-1990s and reconstructed. No reporter or detective in the U.S. could verify anything about the M-15 or about Rowley. The reporters, the conservatives, and the Cuban exile community in the U.S. would simply have to take President Obama's word for it. And last but not least, Rowley could be fit into Popkin's successful article, which was already taken for granted by people who follow intelligence matters. President Obama was not going to handle this through Washington. He was going to handle this through Hollywood. But let's look at this in light most favorable to Popkin's recent article, which reflects the official story told by the Obama administration. Assuming Rowley provided the codes in 1994, the Cubans would have changed the codes as soon as they arrested him. So how did President Obama cover that hole in order to justify Rowley at all costs? Popkin simply regurgitates what an anonymous intelligence officer whispers in his ears. The Cubans were supposed to change the crypto codes every six months to minimize security risks, but they got careless. The Cubans fucked up. They occasionally use the crypto keys more than once. This is nothing more than a deliberate and anonymous leak, designed to preempt any questions that may arise in regards to how the codes provided by Rowley in 1994 were still active in the year 2009. For instance, the Myers didn't use crypto codes. They used the Morse code. Yet the Obama administration also credited Rolando Saraf with outing the Myers. If Rowley would have given up the codes in 1994, they would have caught Ana Montes way before the year 2001. The FBI would not have allowed her to turn so much information over to the Cubans before neutralizing her. The Cubans are widely recognized as having one of the most effective intelligence services on Earth. That's a mighty achievement for what is commonly treated as a banana republic. Are the Cubans so successful because they use sophisticated 007 gadgetry? No. They are successful because they are experts at characterizing and recruiting people. They excel at persuading people to help them for ideological reasons. Cuban agents cannot be detected through high technology because they don't use any. They do their thing person to person. This is a coat the Cubans made for me. It has a Velcro seal in which you can hide documents and walk past the guards undetected. And this is a notebook the Cubans also made for me. You release the screw that releases the ring on the outside. And the uh, ring binder falls off. Inside, you can fit all kinds of things. For example, wafers, silicon wafers, used in the semiconductor industry. <laughs> and this is a tiny cassette recorder, 1990s technology. You can hook it up to a uh, microphone pen, which you carry in your pocket. Good to uh, record FBI and CIA agents. Or you can hook it up to a phone pickup and record your wife and your neighbor on the phone. My handlers gave me instructions written on rice paper that I was supposed to swallow in case of an emergency. Ana Montes and the Myers got in addition shortwave radios to listen in on specific things the Cubans wanted to tell them. But you don't catch spies these days through codes like in World War II. Even if you were able to decipher a code, almost always because of some kind of betrayal, the meaning of the message is also coded. The code might be deciphered as, take the spoon and put it on the table. You decipher the code, but what does it mean? Who is it for? In the case of Ana Montes, some of the codes made public read, I can't hear radio, received message, danger, left the country. 
These are clearly emergency contact codes. If the agencies found the paper in the trash can and learned the code, who are they for? Where is this anonymous person working? What is he stealing? Spies are not caught because someone breaks their crypto codes. Spies are caught when someone snitches on them. The Obama administration credited Rowley because it knew that most people are conditioned by Hollywood to have this 007 vision of contemporary spying. And that brings us to the final point. Jim Popkin styles himself as or insinuates that he is, a reporter who has access to anonymous intelligence sources that whisper secrets in his ears. The facts are that the FBI is neither investigating nor arresting any of these traitors who are leaking vital information to the press. Therefore, it is safer to conclude not only that the information they leak through dupes like Popkin and Simmons is not classified, but is information that the Obama administration wants you to hear. Indeed, it is quite interesting that they leaked the story of how they caught Ana Montes in great detail to achieve a political objective. On the other hand, when you look up how they caught the Myers, you find not a word. I mean, if the Myers weren't ratted out, and the methods used to detect them are as classified as the methods used to detect Anamontes. I'm sure a lot of reporters out there, as well as the Russians and the Chinese, would love to hear how they did it through informal sources such as Popkin and Simmons. Chris Simmons thinks of himself as this great spy catcher, an armchair 007 who detects moles through his computer. Make no mistake, like Carmichael, Chris Simmons is just a pizza delivery boy. His job is to take a mouth to Miami and bring back an ear to Washington. Oh, and by the way, that anonymous female intelligence agent that risked her career whispering to Simmons that there was a spy high up in the U.S. government? That was Anna's sister Lucy, who worked for the FBI doing translations of the dialogues of the WASP spy network. Kind of like the case of Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, who was ratted on by his brother. Lucy wasn't even surprised when she was told that Anna was arrested, and she offered Anna her home upon release, probably to make it up to her. Both Simmons and Carmichael knew Anna Montes years before they outed her, and everyone close to Anna Montes knew that she was a leftist, except, of course, the people at the Defense Intelligence Agency who were supposed to do a thorough background check on her. So Simmons and Carmichael did not find Ana Montes by searching the DIA database, in great measure because the mole could have been in any of the myriads of government departments. If at all, Simmons and Carmichael did some reverse engineering. They knew the name of Ana Montes, that she was a leftist, and that she acted suspiciously. They already had doubts about her years before the information about the mole surfaced. When Lucy told them that there was a mole, all that Simmons and Carmichael needed to do was verify their hunch. They merely fit the face to the facts. No sophisticated intelligence necessary. Regarding official sources that Obama used to get the message out about Rowley being a cryptographer and who mostly wished to remain anonymous, one of them is Alan P. Hale, an individual with an extensive resume in dealing with the press. Among his achievements, Mr. Hale was at one time responsible for disinforming the public about weapons of mass destruction. Another source that spread the word that Rowley was a cryptographer and the most important spy the U.S. had in Cuba, for unknown reasons, has to remain anonymous. However, the info by a reporter published the name of the official. His name is James R. Clapper and he's the Director of National Intelligence. When you look up Clapper, you discover that two U.S. representatives accused Clapper of perjury for telling a congressional committee in March 2013 that the NSA does not collect any type of data at all on millions of Americans. One senator asked for his resignation, 
and a group of 26 senators complained about Clapper's responses under questioning. Media observers have described Clapper as having lied under oath, having obstructed justice, and having given false testimony. Maybe this explains why Clapper has to remain anonymous. Rowley has already served his purpose. His sole purpose was to deceive Cuban exiles and congressional conservative leaders into believing that the U.S. got a good deal in the spy swap. And make no mistake, Rowley is not being hidden for medical reasons or for extensive debriefing. For instance, Yuri Nozenko, the Soviet defector, was held for over three years because the CIA had doubts about his credentials and honesty. This isn't the case with Rowley. The U.S. does not have to verify whether Rowley is authentic. If the Obama administration tells you that the agencies need to debrief Rowley for eight or ten months, you know that they are just giving you more runaround. Rowley is hidden for nothing more than to keep him away from the press. Most of all, President Obama counted on the fact that the press and the public have very short attention spans. He correctly predicted that the public would soon forget about the swap issue and focus on the new relations between Cuba and the United States. He knew that the bargaining chip issue would die by amnesia, a uh, media version of pocket veto. It's only been a month since Rowley's been exchanged, and already he's no longer news. He is now history.